OpenAI says GPT-5.2 Codex is the best coding model yet. Reliable tool calling, native compaction, and even more efficient use of tokens while reasoning. So I did what I always do. I put it up against five other models, ran it through the exact same challenge, the same analysis, the same implementation, and the exact same evaluators to see how it performed. The short answer, and I'll give it to you right up here, right up front, is no. Actually, I couldn't find any major differences at all. Now, admittedly, they call out cybersecurity. I will admit I did not, I did not challenge that aspect at all. However, everything else that I did challenge, not only did 5.2 Codex not perform quite as well, there were some places that it actually performed a little bit less well. It's a very, very good model, don't get me wrong. And in fact, if you're on Windows, it may really turn the, uh, the dial for you because they really did some real tool calling work in Windows. So it really is the place to go there. But it was a little bit slower. It used a little bit more tokens and it came out with worse results. And the most important one to me is it actually communicates a little bit worse than the 5.2 non-codex model. But I wanna show you what I did. I took seven models from OpenAI, Claude, and Gemini and measured two things how well they analyzed and identified the problems in an old code base, and how well they fixed them. And I used evaluators to judge everything. I'm gonna walk you through the results of these systems and take a look at their analysis. And in fact, I'm gonna show you a couple surprising findings, including one model that really completely fell over in a way that I'm still surprised by and can't really explain. And I'll be honest with you, the most important finding of all of this multiple days of work to get here was not really the codex thing, because as you can tell, they kind of are very comparable with one another at best. It was actually how these models communicate how they got to the answers, not just what their analysis was, that's something we've seen in the past, but kind of their thought process throughout the whole thing. And I'm calling this context mapping the idea of being able to hand off how a model got to its conclusion or where it is currently, the things that it's considered, a whole bunch of other things. I think this is going to be fundamentally important to us with working in, with agents in the future. And it's something that I'm shooting a whole video on. If something like that's interesting, please subscribe. That I hope will be my very next video. And I think it's really important. But first, let's talk about this codex problem. Okay, so what did I actually throw at these models? This is YouTube TV's NFL page. What you're seeing is a list of all of the shows that it's aware of, and you'll see it's a partial list. That's important in a second. I wrote a Chrome extension, this is probably seven or eight years ago almost at this point, to help me kind of identify what I'm interested in and what I'm not interested in. Okay, what it does is pretty simple. It puts these little dots here on each one of these episode rows, and you'll see some rows rows have different levels already applied to them. So if we took this game here, I might say I'm mildly interested or not interested or highly interested. And that's what the dots can do for us is just allow for kind of selection of excitement around a specific game or episode or something like that. Now this sounds really simple, but of course, when you reload the browser, we need this to come back. It needs to be sticky. It needs to keep drawing this yellow ring around this game forever. Otherwise it's pretty much meaningless. And really right within that is the whole crux of the system. That's the most difficult part because a system like this doesn't give you as an extension developer much to work with. This row or this game is not actually identified in any meaningful way. And all the extension has to work with is basically the HTML, if you will, that's been rendered here, that's drawing this, this row. That HTML can be as dynamic as the team wants it to be. It doesn't have to say anything unique about this game. The main problem that you'll be hearing is being able to identify each one of these rows. Being able to get an ID is almost impossible as a source of truth. So it is that extension is kind of really doing a lot of work to try to infer what game this is from the names of the teams that are playing, the date that it's playing, the thumbnail URL, the URL that it launched to if you kick off the game. It's got a lot of different mitigation strategies to try to get down to an ID so that this yellow ring doesn't accidentally start showing up against a different game. That's really the crux. And also, by the way, like I said, this is an extension that I wrote for my own use. I've been using it for many years. 
No one else has ever seen this, so I really didn't care how it was written at the time. If I needed changes, I would make a quick change. It is not architected all that well. So what I decided to do is give this to these models because it really represents a good example of working code that cannot be disrupted, but absolutely has some room for growth. Can it identify each model, that is, what it could be better at or where the risks are? That's the real challenge here. Okay, let me show you just a little bit of the methodology and then we'll get into some of the results. What I'm sharing here is a folder called eval. You'll see that there's five steps here. The first one is the agent's job and then I use the evaluate. The agent is, whether it's Gemini or it's GPT-5.2 or whatever it might be, and then I say, go execute this file, 01 agent analysis. It reads this. One of the things that it knows it needs to look into is this folder of instructions. We'll look at that in a second. The next step, once this is finished, I then go over to Claude Code in planning mode mode for Opus 4.5 so that they're all, all of these eval steps are done by the exact same model intentionally so that the comparison between all these parts are the same. So each one of these, you can see the agent does its analysis and then we use the eval agent to analyze its results and give us results. The agent analysis, which would be that very first step, go take a look, see what you can find. It has a start here. Each one of these has a start here. That start here is kind of a orientation of here's what you're doing in this step. Here's the responsibilities you have, et cetera, et cetera. What you're going to want to go read is this PRD. And this, as you can see, is a pretty big PRD of me describing everything, the objective of the system, what it's trying to do. I was trying to be as fair as possible as if I had given this a real task of not just cold, go learn everything, but here's what it's trying to do. Go take a look at it, figure these things out, like separation of concerns, fragile string manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. So I was being pretty predictive of what they might be looking for and what they might be able to find, but I'm also very clear about go find things that are not described. Okay, enough of kind of the, what are we doing? What are we asking these systems to do? Let's take a look at some of their findings. Okay, so let's take a look at the results that these put out. Now recall what I'm doing is I'm asking the system to go do the analysis, determine everything that I've kind of described in that big PRD, but also go find as much as it can that I might not have described. And so we're looking for some novel findings in these outputs. I am also very, very clearly saying, I want you to go at those documents and create what you're seeing here, a single page application. You might hear me say SPA. This is kind of that context map. I want to understand not just what your findings are, how you arrived at them, what you considered, what really the risks are, but I need you to talk to me in two ways. I need you to talk to me a little bit technically so that I know what you're doing, and I need you to talk to me as if I'm just kind of a, a decision leader that might not have full awareness of what's going on in this system. All right, so I wanna look at these two outputs briefly. We can't go through them, they're super dense. It's not worth actually going through them, but I will show you the differences and kind of their approaches to some degree and the scores that the evaluator gave to each. It's pretty simple. So the first one we're looking at, this is the non-codex model. So this is the old one. A couple of weeks ago, this was top of the top of the heap for OpenAI. And what it's trying to do is tell us specifically, this is what it's asked to do. Tell us about the application that we're we're doing. That's this extension. It adds five dots for interest that you can use on YouTube TV's browse, blah, blah, blah things we've seen. You'll also see that it has an overview of the architecture, how it lay out, lays out and what's important, what files might be important in that aspect or what technical aspects are, are needed. And then at the bottom down here, you'll see all of the proposed changes. This is basically the stuff that it found. I will say just for simplicity's sake, they roughly found the same things. As I've mentioned, these things really performed the same. And so we won't necessarily go into these except to say they are intended that you tell us what is wrong, restrict the content script to YouTube TV hosts. Okay, good. Gives us a little bit of a technical detail here. It is kind of a very open pattern and you should do it just for the tv.youtube.com domain. Okay, that makes sense. Gives us some details on it. It's a little bit light and you have to be pretty technical to understand what it's saying. So I wouldn't say that this matches the bar of if you're just a thought leader and you're trying to make a decision of something, whether or not it's important, it does describe this, the risks, the why you would do it, what needs to change, but it takes a lot of ingesting to figure out what they're talking about. Up the, at the top here, it talks about the what this is and then 
the risks themselves. So in other words, if we don't do some of these things, what might go wrong or what do we need to protect against? And then what is the plan that we're taking on? Okay, so this is GPT-5.2 non-codex. I think it does a pretty darn good job of communicating what it's trying to do or what it what it found, you know, kind of its advice that it's giving. So let's take a quick look at the Codex version. All right, and so here we are in this same system from Codex, uh, 5.2 Codex Max standpoint, and it's trying to do exactly the same things because it was given the same requirement to build an SPA of the findings that it has. Again, you can see that it tells us a little bit about the, the feature itself, what it's trying to do, the major aspects of that feature, the system flow. This is that architectural flow to some degree, how the, how the information or how the different aspects of the program come into play and when they're important. Tells us a little bit about why it's fragile. And then there are some constraints that are non-negotiable. It goes through the key risks that it found. And then each one of the changes, this again is that scope it to YouTube TV and not be as open. If we look in, it has a little bit of a description, but it's not really exactly clear what's going on here. It did a lot of work to try to come up with these bars and a representation, but I really have to be technical to understand what it's talking about here. It definitely is not telling me any code information, code lines. It's not giving me hints of what it might change or why or what the risks are if we don't change them. So it's missing quite a bit. And if we look at the scores that these two systems got, this is the evaluator scoring. The, the On the left is the non-codex version. That's the old version. And on the right is the codex version. They look different because there's no uh, template or prescription to how this stuff comes out. But what you can see is, okay, we get a 27 on one side and a 26 on the other. So it's gone down a plus or minus one, I would say, is basically the same. But it's worth saying that the system comprehension for the old model was a little bit off. It says it spent more time on the what than deeply explaining the why. And and on the right, it doesn't tell us the trade-offs, as I was mentioning. It doesn't tell us what's the risk if we don't do something or is what you're advising more technical than we need? Does it end up bloating the system? It's just a simple extension. Does it need it? It also gets dinged, unlike this one over here, which gets a four out of that communication step, the document we were just looking at. This one only gets a three, and it's a pretty low score across all of the models that have, have delivered. And I believe these numbers actually hold a little bit. The intention isn't necessarily, the numbers don't get too hung up on that. This is pretty subjective stuff on a pretty small surface area, but at the same time, Looking at the two documents we were just looking at, I do agree, one does a much better job of communicating, even though they've largely found really closely the same list. Okay, so here, I'm gonna share this one with you just briefly. I won't go through everything it's doing, but this is our baseline. This is Opus 4.5 in planning mode. This is the SPA or the context map that it came back with to try to tell me what system are we looking at, what is it supposed to do? What does it do well? What did I think about? What risks does it have? What problems does it have that I think we should, all of those kinds of things. And you can see it's telling a story. It's even a thematic story in this case of kind of, uh, I guess, going to the hospital to some degree. So our patient is a Chrome extension that solves real problems for NFL fans on YouTube TV. Imagine browsing YouTube TV's NFL selection. You see a wall of games. You're uh, Some you're excited about, others you couldn't care less about, but they all look the same. There's no way to mark your preference. Okay, so it's, it is obviously getting that concept of telling a story. Someone that doesn't understand the surface area would fully understand this. It in fact goes so far as to create a dynamic interface here of exactly how the thing works to kind of describe it to somebody. So I think this is a great example of what I was looking for and very explicitly what I was asking for. And it goes through all of the different parts. Here is how the application lays itself out. It even mentions that there's a a fundamental challenge. YouTube TV provides no official API and no stable identifiers for games. It's like trying to recognize people by their outfits when they keep changing clothes every day. And it's like a really honestly trying to tell us what's difficult all the way down to the bottom where you can see here are the different strategies. Here's the, the, the class that it's in and the lines that you would care about. Here's the different mitigation or identification strategies that are used. So a really good job of trying to slowly walk us into what the challenge is, the different names of them and what they're useful for. And then it goes in and finds those different uh, kind of risks that we were seeing in the other. So each one of these is a technical risk. It gives us references to the files, the lines that it was found on, 
Um, it even highlights the areas that it thinks are actual problems and how to fix them. This is fantastic. This is the way that we need to see what models are doing on the inside of stuff. Again, later video, very exciting. I definitely want to talk about this, but I just wanted to show you this is best in breed. I want to be communicated to this way, not just a table of bars that say this one's important and this one's not, and trust us. Okay, and I just have to very briefly share with you the model that fell on its face. It earned the award of most surprising finding of just about everything, and that's Gemini. What I'm sharing with you is the Gemini output. I am not going to go through it. You're going to just have to take my word for it. This was a train wreck. I ran it many times. This is four or five times that I ran this. It always did this. If you remember the big PRD that we put in and said, go find things similar to this and look for other stuff, it found only some of the things that were mentioned in the PRD, and it literally did not find a single thing that was not mentioned in the PRD, unlike every single other model. All it shares here is these three problems, all of which were named inside of the uh, PRD itself, but also, it did not find many of the other challenges, like the way that we're dealing with the three different mitigations for IDs, things that were major cruxes for the rest of the models, and they all found those kinds of things. It is so lightweight, it's not worth going through, but I will say this, I, I find the Gemini 3 Pro model a good model to code with, so this is just shocking. It is worth saying its implementation, when it went and did work, was against this surface area, not surprisingly. What it finds is what it's going to fix, and what we've asked it to do is go find what it can find, and this is what it found. So I will, I, I just want to put this warning out there that you need to keep an eye on the Gemini 3 model for a minute to make sure that it's really finding everything it should. It works very well against the area that it's actually finding. That's not the problem. But this was shocking, the difference between what it found and what all of the other models found. All right, I, I did say it up front, the, there's no real big difference here. I will call out cybersecurity again. It's one of the things they, they called out very clearly in this model release. If you have any interest in security, those kinds of things, the Codex model is one you want to kind of take a look at and run some tests against. And also, Windows tool calling was very specifically called out, and that can't be understated. Anything that can do a better job of tool calling is going to be helpful. And I think had I used these models on something that was a much longer time horizon, this is a pretty small change, that I would have seen a bigger delta between them and the codex model probably would have shown out to be more, both more efficient and maybe a little bit faster. That better tool calling really does matter. If, if it's a coin flip for you and it really doesn't matter either way, definitely use the codex model. That's what it's intended for, so it's gonna be better at it. But if my real findings are, they're basically the same thing at this point still, largely. All right, with that, I will say, keep an eye out for that next one. I'm super excited about that next video, which is really about that context mapping and where I think that we're going to be really needing these models to be able to tell us what they're thinking in a much more informed way than just simply, here's my answer and we need to move forward with it and we're just gonna have to trust it. I hope you're interested in that. I'm definitely interested in that. Thanks for coming along for the ride on this one and I'll see you in the next one.